Hello, I'm Mrs Pearce and I'm Head of Food. And today I'm going to talk to you about why you could consider taking the hospitality and catering option. This course is designed to develop your practical cooking skills as well as giving you an insight and understanding of how the hospitality and catering industry works at different levels. This ranges from the kitchen brigade, executive chefs through to kitchen porters, to housekeeping and management positions and the different roles and responsibilities of the restaurant brigade from front of house to sommeliers. Throughout the course you'll develop an understanding of the different roles within the hospitality and catering industry and the skills and qualifications you would need to pursue these careers. We follow the WJEC hospitality and catering industry specification. It's made up of two units. Unit 1 is a theory unit and it's worth 40% of the final grade and unit 2 is a scenario based coursework project with the scenario being set by the exam board um, and it has a practical cooking element to it. To pass this course at level 1 or level 2 you must complete all of the assessment criteria as well as both the written exam and practical exam. As well as developing your practical preparation and cooking skills this course will develop links with other subjects you will learn about more about food provenance and sustainability, which links to geography. You will be learning about diet and health issues, which link to science and sport. Your numeracy skills will be developed through the practical application of costing and planning menus and be able to round up recipes. This course is a vocational course, which is an equivalent to a GCSE. So why study hospitality and catering? We've found that this course works really well for the students at Carshorton High School for Girls and allows them to succeed if they are focused and willing to work. It gives them very good grounding for further higher level courses. Students have gone from here to other catering colleges, including Westminster, where chefs such as Jamie Oliver and Gordon Ramsay trained. Let's have a look at some other reasons. You will be learning a new range of skills and techniques, including different types of vegetable cuts, deboning a chicken, filleting a fish, making pasta and making different types of pastry. You'll also be encouraged to research different types of cuisine and use these influences in the dishes that you design. And you'll also be able to explain how to create dishes with ethically sourced ingredients and why that this may be important. The presentation of your food is also going to be very important and you will practice different styles of food presentation within a culinary arts project. Reason 2. Taste testing and experimentation with flavours and textures are important when developing ideas for new recipes. Not only will you be cooking one-off dishes, but you will be expected to cater for an event where you will work with others in the kitchen to produce larger batches of food. This will help to develop your communication, time management and teamwork skills, as well as applying your numeracy skills to work out the quantities of ingredients needed. When developing menus for others, it's also important to consider people's dietary needs and the consequences of not doing so. We'll also look at the risks associated with the industry and the laws that are put in place to minimise these risks. Reason 3. This is a vocational course and it has a practical controlled assessment task which is worth 60% of the overall grade. In the exam, you will have four hours to cook two dishes which you will have developed the recipes for. Generally, you'll be expected to cook in school once a fortnight, but we would like you to develop your skills at home too, if that's at all possible. And reason four. The written exam is only 90 minutes long and covers four learning objectives. It will assess your knowledge of the industry, including different types of provision from five-star luxury hotels to schools and hospital provision. So where could this course lead you? Well, it could lead to a career in food that could take you around the world, from being a chef in the armed services to working in a five-star hotel chain. It could even be the first stepping stone in a career in food photography or food journalism. Watch the film clips on the next slide to see how you could fit into this industry. If you have any questions about this course, please come and see me, Mrs Pearce, or Ms Bryce, or email us to ask any further questions about this course. Thank you for listening. Every week, over 6,600 people vacation aboard the world's largest cruise ship. And all those people need to eat three, four, eight times a day. 
you have to calculate that it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, plus snacks, plus at night, plus all 24 hours food all around, and that never stops. Ship kitchens run 24 7, manned by a culinary team of more than a thousand people. They dish out over 30,000 meals every single day. And they do it all from compact kitchens on a rocking ship. So how does all this food make it to the plate? We'll start on the loading dock on a Saturday. This is turnaround day, when all new food is delivered to deck two. This is basically a place that you would not like to be on, on turnaround day when we are loading. It's busy, busy, super busy. That's Jarrett. He orders food for the ship's 23 different restaurants. Every week, Jarrett's got a $1 million shopping budget. All of that is just for seven days of food. Sometimes Jarrett will tweak his orders based on who's coming aboard. More kids means more chicken fingers. That's how the operation runs. So we monitor it on a daily basis, what has been used, what has not been used, and then we adjust our orders accordingly. But by and large, being in Miami, having the same number of people, it's almost the same every cruise. On turnaround day, 30 trucks arrive at Miami port. They're carrying 500 pallets worth of inventory, and all that has to be loaded onto the ship by 4 p.m. Any delay in our operation can hamper the sail away of the ship, which is again a big logistic requirement. Over 600,000 pounds of food and drinks are provisioned for just one week of sailing. Once on board, everything is moved along the ship's secret highway. This is I-95, and it runs the entire length of the ship on deck two. We separate all the stores to the different locations that they are supposed to go. We have about 20 different storerooms divided into freezers, fridges, walk-in fridges, and dry stores. Seafood, meat, vegetables, and fruit are all divided and stored in separate fridges. If you come towards the end of the cruise, this box will be almost empty with a few fruits that are needed for two more days, which we keep as backup stock. There are also six freezers. That's where the 700 pounds of ice cream that'll be eaten each week are stored. Dry goods are stored down on deck one. Full of spices, full of chocolate in this storeroom. Coffee, it's nice to be in this storeroom. <laughs> An elevator gets the food downstairs. Jared's team checks all of the food for quality control every day. If produce is ripening faster than expected, they try to work it into another meal. For example, overripe broccoli could go into broccoli cheddar soup instead of being tossed. Once inventory is stored, restaurants on upper decks put in food orders with Jarrett. Chefs will come downstairs, pick up their order, and cart it away to be cooked. That's where this guy comes in. Any food on board this beautiful ship, anything you eat, is my responsibility. Wherever you have beautiful potato fry, it's mine. Rice, is mine. Pate, is mine. Pastry, is mine. Salad, shrimp, whatever you eat, is my responsibility. Rijo's team of 280 chefs run the kitchens 24-7. Each chef works 10 to 12 hour days. Contracts typically last four months without a single day off. Some of the people start to working for eight o'clock in the morning, all the way to two o'clock, take a break, come back again five o'clock, feeding by 9.30. The other group start to work in 10 o'clock in the night, all the way to 10 o'clock in the morning. So we cover day and night productions. Chefs on board cook up nearly 100 different menus every week. All the menus are developed at Royal Caribbean's Miami headquarters. And every week, chefs stick to the same rotation of menus, cooking up everything from racks of lamb to hand-rolled sushi. The food has to be diverse to match Symphony of the Seas international passengers, vacationing at all kinds of price points. We try to please everybody and to make sure that everybody find what you're looking for. All the cooking happens in 36 kitchens, or galleys as they're called on a ship. There are 12 specialty restaurants on board, costing up to $50 a person and each of those restaurants has its own small galley. In those tight quarters, chefs crank out the same menu every day. At Jamie's Italian, it's fresh pasta. At Hooked, it's over 2,000 oysters, shocked per cruise. But the largest amount of food is reserved for the main dining room, which spans three decks and serves up to 6,000 people a night. Eating here is included in your ticket. Before food heads up to the main galleys, it starts in one of the prep kitchens, off I-95. There's a butcher shop. Butcher, good morning. Yes, sir. These are the gentlemen looking after all the meat cuts. The butcher goes through about 15,000 pounds of beef and 9,700 pounds of chicken each week. There's also a veggie cutting room and a fish thawing box. Lobster is the most popular dish in main dining. The ship goes through about 2,100 pounds of lobster tails every week. Finally, the food heads upstairs to the main galley. 
The ship's biggest kitchen is broken down by categories. Desserts, bread, cold food, and hot food. In dessert, chefs whip up cakes, chocolates, and a hundred different types of pastries. Over in the bread bakery, they make 40 different kinds of bread from all over the world, all from scratch. But the real hustle comes just before the dinner rush. 6,000 hungry passengers in the main dining room. Remember Rijo? Before dinner prep starts, he has to approve all the dishes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Rijo tries each dish and gives his critiques. We're gonna put a little bit more hair, no, a little bit more garlic, a little bit more hair. Very, very good, so this is what we Aioli. Aioli, we need to put a little bit more for today, huh? You can see Chef how we look, huh? Take a note, don't forget, huh? Chefs take his notes and get cooking. Chefs can see a tally of each dish ordered up on screens. The system also keeps track of how much inventory is used. In the cold room, salads and appetizers like carpaccio come together. In the hot room, Chefs dish out soups, sauces, sides, and mains. We have the two kinds of chefs. Chefs working here on the line, which is close to me, plating up, and chefs on the stove cooking. So everything we do is in batch cooking. So basically, we grill a steak there, we pass it over to the pass, the person on the pass is plating it up to the requested temperature. That means always that the guests are getting fresh food, and from an operational point, we don't have any overproduction. Finally, waiters deliver those dishes to hungry passengers out in main dining. Between the chefs, inventory crew, waiters, and dishwashers, it takes a team of 1,085 people to keep this massive operation going. Together, they cook nearly 11 million meals each year, and they're doing it all on a moving ship. The ship is rocking. Then all the equipment is built to the ship rocket. Then in whatever moment, maybe the ship move, somebody don't put one brake in one, in one trolley, and you see the trolley flying away and happen. That's why all the cooks always be the attention with that. But if crew members are doing their job right, passengers won't even know any of it's happening. They'll just get back to eating their eighth meal of the day. <laughs>